I was born in Grimsby uh, way back in 1943, um, more about that later, except to say that one of the nicest things about growing older is that you get to have more birthdays, <laughs> so I can recommend it. God has laid it upon my heart uh, for some time to um, share with you some of the extraordinary encounters that I have experienced in my walk with Jesus uh, and uh, upon which I have built uh, my life. And I'd like to start with a personal workshop that Jesus gave me on physical healing. When I was um, 40 years old, I laid down a very prominent career in Singapore as a stockbroker. And I went with my wife to Christ for the Nations Bible School in Dallas in Texas. And when we arrived, for the first time in my life, this I was 40 years old, but the first time in my life I was experiencing pain um, in my back. Now, I had played a lot of football, but somehow my right leg had slowly become shorter than my left leg. And so I was like walking on the side of a hill. Um, and a Christian chiropractor told me that I needed either a built up shoe or a miracle. And um, I believe God for a miracle. I was in the right place. Every morning in chapel, 1,500 students from all over the world got together to worship the Lord. One morning, as we were singing the 1 Corinthians 3.16 song, Know ye not, know ye not, you are the temple. God just gave me a revelation that I am a temple of the Holy Spirit. And then flooding into my mind was uh, Romans 8.11 that the same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead now dwells in you and will quicken your mortal body. Amen. Amen. And then God gave me a vision. It was like an umbilical cord flowing from the heavenless and plugging into my body. It was as if the power of God from the very throne of God was flowing into my body. And then I saw these words. I can repair the temple in which I live. Amen. Now you think about that, brothers and sisters. If you need a healing this evening, Jesus said, I can repair the temple in which I live. That night, my wife and I were hosting some students to an evangelistic uh, meeting in Dallas, organized by FGB. In fact, this was going to be my very first FGB dinner. But if I could have found a way to pull out of it, I would have done, because I had just discovered that Pastor Cho yong Yi from South Korea was addressing a meeting in Dallas at the same time. Anyway, the FTB speaker was a man from St. Louis called Walter Moore. He was an international director of FGB and a well-known architect. And after the dinner, he just invited everyone that needed a healing to come forward. Now, I wasn't expecting that at all. And so I got up so quickly I stumbled over because of my lopsided condition. 
And so I ended up uh, second in the queue, instead of first, as I, as I had intended. And Walter so sat me down on a chair, and it was obvious that my right leg was two inches shorter than my left leg. But as he started to speak to me, a remarkable conversation took place. The first thing was he asked me a question. He said, Peter, when do you want to be healed? Now, I don't know about you, but it's very easy to fumble the answer to that question. But right out of my spirit, I responded, now. The second remarkable thing was the very first words that he prayed. He said, Lord, you are the architect of Peter's body. Wow. I mean, that was amazing. In the morning, I had this revelation during worship time that God can repair the temple in which he lives. And then now I've got an architect telling me that the Lord is the architect of my body. And then I knew that God was speaking to me for the second time that day. About healing my body. But I started to panic. I suddenly felt unworthy because I had been grumbling all day long about the Cho Yonggi dinner, that meeting. And so you know how we are. I, I closed my eyes and um, I started to pray, pray in tongues, you know, trying to um, sanctify myself. It's sort of like um, lastminutesanctification.com. Um, and uh, the result was, Walter had to ask me three times to be quiet and open my eyes. I mean, exactly what my wife says to me quite often. On the third time, he said in a voice full of authority, Peter, open your eyes and keep them open because God wants to show you your healing now. That was the Spirit of God speaking. I opened my eyes and within seconds my right leg suddenly energized and shot out two inches. In fact, I praise God, it stopped when it did. <laughs> It's a very exciting thing when God touches your body. I got up from that chair and I staggered away with his extra leg hitting the floor far sooner than I was expecting. And when I got into my car, I had to pull myself around so that I lined up with the pedals. And when I got back to the Bible school, there was an all-night prayer meeting at the auditorium. And I walked for hours just praising the Lord for every second step that I took. So step by step, God wanted to make sure that I would never forget the words he spoke to me that morning, that he can heal the temple in which he lives. It is too late now for the devil to tell me the lie that Jesus Christ does not heal today. Let's face it, an ounce of experience is worth a ton of argument. That night it was prophesied that I'd get a brand new back and that's why I have played another 40 years of football since then. Hallelujah. You know, if you need a healing tonight, let me say this. I mean, Jesus can speak to you directly as he spoke to me. Indeed, I believe that Jesus can heal you while I am speaking. Years ago, 
I was um, speaking at the FGB chapter in Horncastle. And uh, after a few minutes, there was a commotion in the back of the room. And a gentleman was shouting out, I can hear, I can hear. <coughs> so I asked him to come forward. And he gave this marvelous testimony that the Lord restored his hearing while I was speaking. Isn't that wonderful? It is wonderful when God interrupts the meeting. I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful tonight, you know, if God would do that tonight and just interrupt this meeting? <laughs> Hallelujah. I once heard the story of a man who lost his car keys um, on a dark night and he um, got down on his hands and knees underneath the street light to try and find his keys. And a passerby stopped and said, um, excuse me, but can I help you? He said, well, well, yes, I'm, I've lost my car keys. Oh, are you sure you've lost them underneath this street light? Oh, he said, no, but if I don't find them underneath this street light, I will not find them anywhere. And my journey with the Lord began when I realized that Jesus was the light and that I would never find the keys to my life except in his word. You see, God had brought me to a place where I was actually desperate for him to change my life. And you might find that um, difficult to understand that I use the word desperate if I tell you that at that time I was in the middle of a very successful career. So, why did I become desperate for God to change my life? Now, for you to understand that, I need to explain something about my childhood. I mean, some of you, like me, may have had a difficult childhood. My mother fled from my father when I was only four years old, and eventually I ended up with my younger sister in a very large children's home in Grimsby. It was a converted World War I hospital. I passed my 11 plus in that home. <laughs> I was only 10, didn't even know I'd taken the exam, and I was the only child ever in 30 years to pass it in that home. By the grace of God, I was given the temperament to overcome the obstacles that had come my way. But not everyone has that temperament to overcome. And some years ago, I was invited to give the Easter Sunday message in Hull Prison. It's a very old prison, and it's quite a daunting experience uh, navigating through the corridors in order to get to the chapel. Uh, once inside, I sat at the front, and rather nervously, I didn't look behind while all the prisoners were taking their seats. And so I didn't get to see their faces until I was asked to go to the pulpit. I was all ready with my message. But when I looked around, and I saw their faces, God interrupted everything. He gave me a vision. The vision transported me back to when I was a young boy in the children's home. God seemed to be saying to me that these men in the chapel are the same kind of people that you knew as a boy. Mm. 
And as I was sharing this vision with the men, the Holy Spirit prompted me to say a number of things. The first thing I said, may I just have a drink of water? Sorry. The, the first thing, the first thing I said was that the world casually says that all children are born equal. But you know, and I know, but most important, God knows, that simply isn't true. Then I said, the world said, the world says that Johnny will grow out of these things. Abuse, rejection, abandonment, and worse. But well, you know, and I know, but most important, God knows, that Johnny doesn't grow out of these things. Johnny grows into these things. And sometimes Johnny is permanently wounded. Resentful, rebellious, angry, aggressive. And these are the very things which repel the favor that Johnny needs. The very favor that he needs if ever he is to have a chance of climbing out of his adversity. I carried on sharing what the Holy Spirit was saying to me and explaining that God understands what Johnny has been through and that God has never stopped loving Johnny and that God yearns to embrace Johnny. And I remember sharing that wonderful scripture, I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and restoration to give you a future and a hope. A famous Christian psychologist, Dr. James Thompson, once said that the same hot boiling water that makes the carrot soft also makes the egg hard. Hot boiling water, childhood adversity. And he said in his experience there was no way of accounting why some people became like soft carrots and found a way to cope and others became hard like a hard boiled egg. Never recover. They never recover from the abuse that they suffered as children. Now against all the odds, by the grace of God, I found a way to cope. I ended up going top of the grammar school, top of university, I was only 20. I went on to become a very prominent stockbroker in Singapore, my own newspaper column. I, I, I addressed investment conferences all over the world. I was very, very good at what I did. I was in partnership with members of the Prime Minister's family and I was on my way to becoming a seriously rich man. I mean, nothing like the riches that awaits us all in heaven. Not like that kind of richness, but still rich. How on earth did I transition from a children's home in Grimsby to such a fantastic career as a stockbroker? The answer is very simple. As a young boy, I decided to draw into my life by my performance at school, all the things I liked at home. Affection, approval, security, and so on. 
And this mindset followed me everywhere I went into my career. I worked so hard to please people that success was inevitable. And my career took off like a rocket. But in the process, you won't be surprised if I tell you, my career became some sort of an idol. It became the yardstick of everything I was, my self-esteem, my self-worth. You see, it's possible to become so ensnared, enamored, enamored by the pursuit of worldly success. And that's not just money, that's the whole vanity of it, and the status as well, that you miss the real meaning of life. And this is what was happening to me. Although my public persona at that time was one of complete competence, I was actually falling apart with emptiness and loneliness. And then something really, really unexpected happened. I was flying first class from Singapore to address some meetings in London, and someone gave me a Bible and somehow it ended up in my hand luggage. I still can't tell you how. Now, I didn't know anything about the Bible. In fact, I think the only thing I knew about the Bible, which was helpful, was a little ditty that I learned in the children's home. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John went to bed with their trousers on, one shoe off and one shoe on. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. So naturally, I open up the Bible and search for the book of Matthew. And I read it. Until I got as far as Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And God spoke these words into my heart. Seek ye first. You have become an expert on but the next four words you know nothing about oh i kept reading this verse seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you oh what thanks Peace, purpose, happiness, all more things. What was God trying to say to me? And in the next few weeks, I thought more and more about Matthew 6, 33. I met a Chinese pastor called Pastor Hu. I invited him to stay in my apartment free of charge. And I also let a youth church called Golden Harvest use my big lounge for their services on Sundays. This was my first response to Matthew 6.33. But I never attended the services. I was either playing football or I was in the office. And so I had no idea that, that my wife-to-be was one of the leaders of that fellowship. And of course, I had no idea that they'd all be praying for my salvation, this strange person that they never see. <laughs> you see, because I was an educated fool. I knew all these things about stock markets, but I knew nothing about the kingdom of God. Now, Pastor Who has since done his doctorate and so I can now thank God for using Doctor Who <laughs> to gatecrash my life. One day he said to me, he wanted to take me to an evangelistic meeting. I had no idea what he meant by an evangelistic meeting. And I had never come across the word evangelistic in financial vocabulary. It's not there. Anyway, I agreed to go to the meeting. The preacher was an Englishman called Trevor Deering. Up until that time, 
I thought I had heard all the best speakers in the world at financial conferences, but I had never heard the word of God preached. It was like water splashing into an empty bucket. And instantly, instantly, thank God, I knew that it wasn't something that was missing from, from my calculations. It was someone. It was Jesus Christ. And that night, Trevor shared, opened, he opened up with this scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16. We're getting into the 3.16s tonight. 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Amazingly, I knew instantly that this word was true. In the time that it took me to read that single scripture, God gave me faith to believe that the entire Bible is a living document inspired by God cover to cover. And my faith has never wavered since that day. And from that moment onwards, I knew that my compass was no longer in my own understanding or in my education. My compass was my Bible. I then remembered, of course, Matthew 6.33 on the aeroplane. And I realized, ah, that God could speak to me and direct me at any time if I just read the Bible. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And after the meeting, it was, by the way, so unfortunate that so many people today look at the Bible as some dusty old manuscript buried in antiquity. We have to demonstrate, we have to show them, we have to explain to them that the Bible is alive and that Jesus speaks to us through his word. I mean, after the meeting, it was inevitable that I would come to acknowledge that my life did not line up with the word of God. I was in bondage both to my career, obviously, but also to casual relationships with girlfriends. I came to realize that I was looking for security and affection in all the wrong places. And God was flooding my heart with a divine discontent for the way I was living my life. Do excuse me. But there was a problem. I didn't feel that I had the strength to change anything. And so one night, I found myself crying out to God to help me, to stop me, and even to give me a heart attack. Now, don't misunderstand me. I didn't want to die. I just wanted to be set free. And I knew that in my own strength, I couldn't do it. I just wanted to be set free. So I remember crying out to God to do whatever it takes to make me useless to mammon and useless to Satan. My actual words, that was the cry of my heart. Yes, God. And the only solution that I could envisage to set me free was a heart attack. The reason I could pray that way is because reading the Bible, I had become convinced that God loved me so much that I could trust him to put the pieces of my life together again, his way and not mine. So I prayed for a heart attack. 
The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and violent men seize it, guard it, take it by force. The Bible also says that if you seek me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart. <laughs> what a wonderful promise that is. God says, seek me and you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. You know, we live in an instalment society. But God doesn't want installments. He wants our whole heart. And he wants it now. You know, God does not stand afar off in some distant cosmic space and look at us and say, you know what? Your life is pretty messed up right now. Let's leave things for a while while you sort out your own mess. God will never say that. God says, look, I can see the mess. I can see that you feel unworthy. I can see that you think you need to pray for a heart attack to get my attention. But all I want is for you to come to me just as you are. Just give your heart to me and I will do the rest. And so in praying for a heart attack, a violent prayer, foolish prayer but God honors violent prayers. In praying for a heart attack, God, I found God, I found God, because he answered my prayer immediately. The following day, the last day of the Billy Graham crusade in Singapore, I hadn't attended prior to that, but on the last day of the Billy Graham crusade, God gave me a heart attack, but it wasn't the one I had expected or requested. I, God introduced me to a very beautiful Singapore girl who loved the Lord. She was miles ahead of me. She loved the Lord and she became my wife. I was only there because Pastor Who, back to Matthew 6.33, Pastor Who gave me a VIP ticket last minute which he had received from Suyin's mother, who herself had received it from Suyin. So there we are, lovely divine chain. In fact, several miraculous events took place concerning the way that the Lord put Suyin and I together. And, uh, and, and, but that's for another time, that is for another time. So God delivered me from a successful career. He placed me in the wilderness for a reason and a season. And all I have known, all I've known is the peace of God, which is the most tangible reality of the Christian life. And God has been wonderfully faithful to me, to my family and our four children and our grandchildren in so many ways. And God keeps reminding me that the only career that really matters is the one that each one of us is being prepared for when our Lord returns, which will be very soon. I am writing a book. Never thought I would write a book. I've written extensively all my life, financial material all over the world, but I never imagined I write a book on the soon coming of the Lord. So, you know, we are not waiting for the very brief one world government of the Antichrist. We are waiting 
for the eternal one world government of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now pay great attention to what the Holy Spirit causes you to feel passionate about, causes you to take an extraordinary sudden interest in, because I believe that he is preparing you for your assignment, which we will have when we rule and reign with him for a thousand years, when we return with Jesus to a very traumatized world whose population is no longer 9 billion, but 4.5 billion. But I won't go into that because the Bible does it better. Before I close, God has laid it upon my heart to share with you perhaps the most profound experience um, I've ever had in my walk with Jesus. Four weeks after I met Su Yin, at the Billy Graham crusade. She told me that her boss wanted to meet me. He would have known about me from the newspapers, but I didn't know anything about her, her boss. Her boss was Canon James Wong, greatly used in the renewal of the Anglican community in Singapore. Now, when we arrived at Canon's home, St. Peter's Hall, there was no personal greetings. Instead, this great soldier for Christ just asked me a question. He said, have you ever had a personal experience of Jesus Christ? That set me back because only four weeks before, I had prayed to God to give me a heart attack. But can I use the words personal experience? That got my attention. I said, uh, no, not really. And he said, would you like one tonight? Immediately. <laughs> Immediately. Would you like one tonight? Would I like to have a personal experience of Jesus Christ tonight? Immediately I said yes. And mercifully, his next words gave me some time to think. Because like a true Singaporean, he said, good, let's eat. <laughs> we love him, don't we? We lost him this year. We love him. After dinner, after dinner, Cannon prayed for me, and then he said, Peter, I now want you to pray. I said, excuse me, Cannon. I said, but you have just prayed something which is so fantastic that if I had lived to be a hundred years, I would never have seen it. And he said, it must have been gone. I said, what was it? I said, well, it was the very first words that you prayed. I said, you said that Lord you know the bruises that Peter suffered as a child because you were there. And immediately he used those words, you were there. I was transported back to a scene in my childhood, long hidden, long hidden, by my memory of a five-year-old boy, short trousers, in an empty room, stood in the corner, hands on my face in the wall, hands on my head, and, and stood on, on one leg like that. 
And when I wobbled over, my father would get very angry and he sometimes would beat me. I don't know why he did that. He must have been mentally ill. You know, I wasn't even thinking about my childhood at this time. I was far too engrossed in the solution, which was my career. But God wanted me to see something which I could hardly believe. I saw Jesus. And he was stood there next to me. And he was smiling. Excitedly, I said, Canon, I know that Jesus is with everyone, everywhere, all of the time. But it would never have occurred to me that he was with me going backwards in time. And if Jesus was there, I mean, I'm so excited by this, then he must have suffered more than I did because he loves me far more than I can love myself. And if Jesus was there, there had to be a purpose. Well, that settles everything for me, everything done. I later I discovered that verse, in everything God works for good yes. to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. In everything? In everything? Yes. Do you mean in all that rejection and, 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 and violence and stuff? You mean, you mean in all of that? Yes, yes, yes. In everything, God works for good. See, God is able to take every experience that the enemy intended to separate you forever from God. He's able to take it and use those experiences for his purposes in your life and his glory. And that is a fact. I realize now, for example, why I was never angry with my father. Never. Right from the beginning, God gave me a supernatural love for my father, which I never lost. He never worked. He was completely dysfunctional, complicated my life unbelievably, but I loved him. And that has been one of the great saving graces in my life. That is why I never became like Johnny and ended up in prison maybe. Praise the Lord for that. I share this with you because perhaps there is someone here tonight who needs to know, like I did, that Jesus was there going back in your own life. He was there in the midst of all of your setbacks and all of your sorrows, just waiting patiently for you to yield to his embrace and his purposes for, for your life. Now as we close, whatever your needs are tonight, have faith in Jesus Christ. If you need a physical healing, remember Jesus said to me, I can repair the temple in which I live. If you feel you are not strong enough to overcome something which is stopping you from surrendering your life to Jesus or giving your whole heart to Jesus. Remember that Jesus invites you to come just as you are. He can set you free from the sin or the fear or the confusion or the doubts which easily beset you. He, he can set you free from sickness and pain. He can fill you with his peace and his joy. And if you're facing a situation in which you really don't know what to do, let me tell you something. 
God tells us exactly what to do. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not upon your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Mm -hmm. Three things we can do. Mm -hmm. Trust in the Lord with all of our heart. Lean not upon your own understanding or fears or anything, but in all your ways, in all your thinking, in all your doing, and in all your speaking, acknowledge him. And then, the thing we cannot do, the thing we always make a mess of, the thing that's impossible for us to get right, God says, I will direct your paths. That's the word of God, brothers and sisters. That's our sustenance. And if there's someone here that has never invited Jesus Christ into their life, let me say one simple thing. No one can guarantee that they will be alive this time next week. This may be your last chance to say yes to Jesus. And therefore, if you haven't done that already, I urge you to say to yourself right now, tonight I'm going to give Jesus a chance. Tonight, I'm not going to leave this meeting without saying yes to Jesus. Tonight, I'm going to trust the rest of my life to Jesus Christ. Jesus promises you, if you seek me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart. It's quite simple. He means it. Now, I don't want to embarrass anyone, so why don't we all just pray together? We just close our eyes and we just say a few simple words uh, after me. Dear Lord Jesus, Dear Lord Jesus I, believe I believe that when you hung on that cross 2,000 years ago, you looked down the ages and you saw me you saw my face you saw my sin you saw my sicknesses you saw my needs and you took them all upon yourself I believe that you went to the cross to bear my sin you paid the price that I could not pay myself. I am truly sorry for the sin in my life. I turn from my sin. I turn to you, Lord. I receive you tonight as my Lord and Savior because the life that I want is your life in me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you have prayed that prayer for the first time tonight, welcome into the family of God. But there is something else that you need to do. You need to tell someone, come and tell me, but just tell someone that you have said yes to Jesus tonight because there is a wonderful promise Jesus says if you confess me before men I will confess you before Father in heaven what a wonderful promise
in a moment, if anyone would like to be receive prayer, my wife is going to come and join me. And I think you may have some words of knowledge for some people. Um, I just want to say thank you for being so patient with me. And uh, God bless.